Right. So last week I was talking about that exchange and exchange has to take place. And I was talking about feet. Right. And an exchange that has to take place in our minds and in our hearts, that where we replace, essentially replace the things that we see, the belief that we have in what is around us with what the word of God says. And that's how we appropriate or receive the, the things of the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God is an opposition to the kingdom of this world. Right? Um, so this second part here, I just have a heading here called Transcending into Supernatural Feet. How to operate in supernatural feet. Right? Um, our natural feet cannot touch the supernatural realm. That's what I was talking about last week. So many churches do not have power because they do not operate in supernatural feet. They remain in the natural realm of belief. So if you take the word of God and apply natural intellect, belief that comes through your intellect, there's nothing that is going to come out of that because the word of God must become spirit to become life. And it's the spirit of God that gives life to the word of God that gives it power. That is how you get power from the word of God. So a lot of churches that operate like um, the, um, what do you call them? The institutional churches, the, the mainline denominational churches who have intellectualized and theologized, the, what is the word? Theologized, I don't know if that's a word. Theologized. 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 The, um, the word of God, they apply human understanding to it. Um, they do not see the power of God at, at work or operating in their midst. Now, they, they have a spiritual understanding of some aspects of the Bible, like, the, like salvation and that sort of thing, right? But there are some scriptures that make them uncomfortable. And they, the reason it makes them uncomfortable because they draw a line as how far they will to extend their belief. And um, they prefer to remain in a sort of zone of comfort where um, their belief will just reside uh, at a certain level, right? So I said a yeah, supernatural faith is energized by the word of God. When God speaks, supernatural faith is released. Or triggered to move in a realm of the supernatural, you must be in a position of hearing God. Luke, this is I want to read from Luke 5 13 to 16. And it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priests and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Right? Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness to pray. He says often. He disconnected himself from everything around to spend time communing with his father. This connection is what allowed him to move in the realm of the supernatural. He said, in John 5, then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things <coughs> that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. If a person does not develop a hearing ear, they will not move in the supernatural realm. 
the challenge is to walk in commu continual communion with God. You cannot switch off that communion. When you are awake, he is there. When you are asleep, he is there. You must develop the ability to operate in the spirit. Hear what the spirit says, Luke 17. Now what happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Hear what it says there. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. How did Jesus know that the power of the Lord was present to heal them? The Father told him. Right? So Jesus knew that the power of God would be able to heal right at that point, right at that time when he was while he was there teaching. To develop an air that cares God, you have to disentangle your senses from this worldly realm. The cares of this world. This is why Jesus went into the wilderness to pray. He didn't do it once or twice. He did it often. This was part of his lifestyle. A person who is engaged with this world and all its promises of riches and fame and comfort and power will become far from God because you cannot serve two masters. Many people devote time and effort for all the things to attain the things that this world have. So 90% 90, 90 of their life is devoted to receiving the things of this world. And how much do they, do, do they devote to the things of the kingdom, the kingdom of God? Faith be, based on belief rooted in your mind, your intellect, your senses is natural faith. Making a decision because your mind instructs you to do it based on your intellect is our natural behavior. We have been trained from birth to operate this way. This has to be unlearned. If you are led by the Spirit of God, you are moving into the supernatural realm where your faith is supernatural. Oftentimes, this is contrary to what our natural thoughts will tell us to do. It may seem as foolishness to our intellect. Never presuppose that you know what God is going to ask you to do or how he is going to do it. Because presupposing means you engage in your mind, your natural mind and your intellect to predetermine what you believe God is going to do. If Jesus had to disengage himself from this world by going into the wilderness to pray, how much more us? The more time we spend communing with our Father, the more we are able to move in the realm of the supernatural. Romans 8 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. To be a son of God, you must put to death the deeds of the body. What are the deeds of the body? Behavior trained into you by your physical body. Let me repeat that again. Behavior trained into you by your physical body. And this, this refers to how you react and respond to your environment. Belief that is ingrained in your true lifelong interaction with the natural world. Your need for the things that this world provides. Sons have authority from their father to act on behalf of their father. It said, remember already just now, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. So to act on the authority of the Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, you must be led by the Spirit of God. All right. Um, there's one in, there's an incident that stands out to me, right? That caught me, give me this particular understanding, right? And this um it was um well in my early Christ, Christian work, what this, this incident was so unusual, right, that I always remembered it. Um, back in those days, I was literally obsessed with God. You know, I mentioned last week, you know, that 
I was close to making that decision to leave everything to follow God. And um, I would be spending every waking moment I have in prayer and reading the word of God. I can remember uh, my, my father, my, my earthly father, he was most upset with me because, you know, I was always locked in the room. He didn't know what I was doing. And um, he wouldn't see me. And then the only time he would see me is when I had my Bible in my hand. I was off to some meeting somewhere, off to church. And that had become my routine. I was always in prayer, always seeking God's counsel. And the reason for that was because when I got saved, the first thing that came out of my lips was I, would, I told God, that I would serve him. And it was a promise I made to God. It was a pledge I made to God. I said, Lord, I will serve you, right? So in my understanding, to serve God means that I had to receive instructions from God. And that was my, you could say my obsession, to receive instruction from God, to know what I had to do. And it, I was like that every day, not just on a Sunday, but every day, right? But this happened one Sunday uh, when I woke up. This was after praying the night before like this, and I woke up in the morning. The Holy Ghost told me to fast. And I just I said, okay. I said, Lord, I just responded. So I decided I was not going to eat anything before I went to church. So I skipped breakfast. And... Um, I went to church, right? And um, when I reached in church, I was an usher in church. And while I was in worship, one of the ushers come and tapped on my shoulder and told me that there was a that there was a woman who wanted to see me, right? So I turned around and looked at the woman. I knew who she was, and she um. So I tell her, I said, "Well, let's go out of the church because there was a lot of noise in each of the worship because she said she wanted to talk." So. I carried her to the back of the church and um, she started telling her all her problems. She um, she was dabbling, well, put in Miley, she was a witch, right? That is exactly what it was. And she had she had powers that she's operating. People used to pay her money to do things for them. Like if somebody lose something, if somebody teeth your car, she would, you would pay her and she will be able to go and sign, tell you where to go and sign it. She said she used to leave her body and travel to other countries and see different places. And um, all of these things was kind of mind, was mind boggling. I never heard, never heard anything like this before. And she said when she was coming to church in the morning, a voice told her to jump in front of a bus and kill herself. And she was hearing voices and voices were telling her to kill herself, you know. And for the last 10 years, she was suffering sickness. She had a weeping wound on her leg, an ulcer. And she was hobbled by that um, ulcer and she was in continual pain. But yeah. I couldn't really think intellectually about what she was saying. All I could think about was, God, you have to intervene in this situation and you have to deliver this woman. So I laid hands, I told her, look, I want to pray for you. And well, we had put her to sit on her chair because of her leg, because of her wound, the wound on her leg. And I laid hands on her to pray for her. And within seconds, when I started to pray, she fell off the chair and fell on the ground. And um, demons started to come out of her, right? Now I say demons, plural, because it was, it was multiple demons began to come out of this woman. And I was totally baffled because I never, had never seen anything. I only read about it in the Bible. I only heard about people doing it. And I wasn't really prepared, 
for something like that. So I had to trust in God and all I could do was kneel on the outside the church and continue praying for this woman, right? Now, when I had woke up in that morning, when God told me to fast, I knew that something was going to happen, but I didn't know what. I had an expectancy that God was going to do something. It wasn't only an expectancy, there was a hope in me. I had a hope in my heart that I would be engaged with God in some way, right? Because I had, I had other supernatural encounters with God. So I knew that God was a supernatural God. And I am... Um, that expectancy in your heart that God is going to be with you, that is faith. So if you're going out, let's say you're going to pray for somebody, somebody asks you for prayer. If you don't have an expectancy in your heart, or even if when you get up in the morning to leave your house and you don't have an expectancy in your heart that God will turn up somehow during the day, God ain't going to turn up. But because expectancy is faith. That is what faith is, expectancy. Right? So I'll just share that little story there because it is an actual manifestation of what I'm talking about. Right? What happened there in that instant, in that moment, was that I managed to just touch the supernatural realm very, very slightly. I just got a glimpse of the supernatural realm. And it was, it was not by my effort or by anything that I did. It wasn't by my will. It was by my obedience to God. God said, fast, and I fasted. The word of the Lord came to me, and I obeyed, right? But I had read the scriptures that said that we would lay hands on the sick, and they would be healed, and we will cast out demons. So I had the faith that the word of God is true. But that faith was energized when the Spirit of God spoke. That when the Spirit of God speaks to you, your, the word that is in you will become supernatural faith. Right? So your soul wants itself to be satisfied and your spirit wants to please God. So your soul always wants satisfaction, but your spirit is always crying out to God. Both are at war with each other. And this battle is fought in your mind. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. To deny self is to disentangle yourself from all the things your soul continually craves. To take up your cross means willful sacrifice. Let me read that again. To take up your cross means willful sacrifice. It's an act of your will. You are willing to sacrifice all for the sake of God's purpose or all for the sake of Christ. Now, how is the Spirit able to release supernatural faith in you? Your response to the Spirit must always be obedience, instant obedience. The motive for your obedience must be love. Listen to this again. This is very, very crucial and very, very important, right? The motive for your obedience must be love. You obey God because you love God. To operate in the supernatural realm of faith, the very first thing that has to be in place in your life is love for God. Your obedience comes out of love. Your obedience doesn't come out of fear. Your obedience doesn't come out of a, um, an intellectual conviction in your, in your mind or in your heart or your, your, your flesh that if I obey God, if I do this for God, God will reward me and I'll get this and this and this and that. That is flesh, right? Your obedience must be out of love for God. First Corinthians 8, 3 says, but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Let's think about that scripture for a second. If anyone loves God, this one is known by him. It means that if you love God, right, and now God will know if you really love him, eh? God searches your heart. 
if you love God, you'll be known by him. In other words, God takes note of what you are doing. God will take note of what you are doing when you love God. So it means that whatever it is you're involved in, God will be involved in it. God will be working with you to bring to pass what it is you're doing, right? The burden of the Lord. When you obey God because you love God, you will be willing to pick up the burden of the Lord. God will trust you with his burden when he sees your heart. This is our next important thing, to, to walk in that kind of faith. God's burden. What is God's burden? God's burden is that all men would be saved. This is God's burden. When God came as a man, he walked with man, he felt as men do, and he had empathy for men. Luke 7, verse 7 to 10. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. <clears throat> so he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother, right? Jesus, it says, he had compassion on the woman. Jesus operated out of a place of compassion. John 11, 35 actually says Jesus wept. It says Jesus wept. That's a short verse. Why did Jesus cry? Because he had empathy for the lostness of men. He saw how lost men were and how poor their faith was. They had no faith. They, it was hard for them to believe that God could raise that young man from the dead. Because it is hard for us to believe. Because all our lives we were taught to not believe. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The burden of the Lord produces compassion in you. Do not be afraid to bear the Lord's burden. Now, back in those days, what I was talking about earlier, I did carry the burden of the Lord. I know what it was to carry the burden of the Lord. Why I'm saying that is because Anytime I saw somebody come to the Lord, I would begin to weep. I just couldn't help it. If there was something in me that I, um, I had a burden for the souls of men, I saw the lostness in people around me. <coughs> the reason by being because I was so lost, I understood what they were going through. I understood why they were doing the things they were doing and saying the things they were saying because I was one. I was there once, and God brought me so far from where I was, and I knew that it wasn't a difficult thing for somebody to get saved because all it had, to, all all it required was that we repent and we believe. That was all it required. So I, my mission was to get people to repent and to believe, you know, and I started in my family and then I also continued with people outside that I would meet and I would always try to bring the mercy of the Lord to people anywhere, everywhere. So carrying his burden must be a motivation in obeying the spirit to move into the supernatural with God. Right? So the burden of the Lord is very, very important. It is really difficult to see the supernatural power of God without moving, without understanding why God came, why God reached out to men, and to understand the, the, the compassion that God has for his creation, for men. And that compassion is as a result 
of love. So if you want to imitate Jesus, we have to imitate Jesus in, in every aspect of his life, with every single, every single thing that he demonstrated. We have to make a choice that we want to, to walk with him that way and to be with him that way and to, to assimilate everything from him that he demonstrated when he was here. And it's really not a work of our mind or our intellect. We have, we have to move away from that. You know, um, many churches today, they don't teach this. They don't talk about it. I sure, I sure only never hear anybody teach this in church. What they will teach you is about how to get wealth, how to get prosperity. And um, they never talk about the burden of the Lord. That is one of the very first things that I, I learned from God, that burden. Because when you carry the burden of the Lord, it comes out in your prayer life. You will pray differently. You will, you will speak differently. You will think differently. Because everything you do will be rooted in compassion. That compassion is very important. Right, so I could say more on that, but I will end it right there because I don't want I don't want to carry the recording too long or the meeting too long. Right? Um, we could talk about it. Let me just pause the stop the recording. But we could talk about it more. But that is essentially what I wanted to share.